sing the very last stanza now of blessed assurance Jesus is mine <clears throat> number 462 blessed assurance Jesus is mine please stand with me Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come to you so thankful for this gift of the Sabbath day. We ask that your spirit fill this place, fill our hearts with love. We thank you for your constant grace and mercy. We thank you so much that you love us with every part of your being. And we want to return that love to you and reflect it to others. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Good morning and welcome to the Loma Linda University Church Sabbath School. We are thankful to see each of you here in the audience. And we also want to welcome those who are watching online, on the computer, on the TV, whichever way you are. Welcome to our Sabbath School here in Loma Linda, California. My name is Lolita Campbell, and I'm a retired educator. I taught at La Sierra University in the School of Education, and I'm thankful I get to be your Sabbath School Superintendent today. This coming week is the day, has a very special day. It's called Valentine's Day, and I'm gonna read a very, very short statement about Valentine's Day written by Helen Steiner Rice. She writes, what are Valentines? Valentines are gifts of love. And with the help of God above, love can change the human race and make this world a better place. For love dissolves all hate and fear and makes our vision bright and clear so we can see and rise above our pettiness on wings of love. This morning, we were blessed to have Marina Williams lead our song service. She is an educator of 21 years. She's taught on the elementary level, the academy level, and the college level. And we always love to hear her beautiful voice here in our Sabbath school. She was accompanied on the organ by Donna Sampson, a longtime Loma Linda uh, resident and worker. We love her fabulous fingers on those organ keys. Thank you to both of you for sharing your talents with us this morning. We have a very special presentation today by Oka. She's going to share her testimony. 
She is from Mongolia, and she is here studying on a doctorate in leadership at La Sierra University. She's here with her husband and two children, and she will share more of her story with us. One of the things she loves to do is play strategy games with children. She must have a very agile mind. Today, we also have a very special presentation for special music. My husband's cousin, Paul Storm, is visiting from Michigan, and he's going to play the guitar, and he's arranged the gospel medley that he's going to be sharing with us. So we look forward to that. Today, our lesson study is brought to us by Ginger Ketting Weller. She's the dean of the School of Education at La Sierra University and my longtime boss. She loves her family, and when she has time to get away from school issues, she spends time with her children and grandchildren and with quilting. As I mentioned earlier, this coming week, we focus on love and thinking about love. And we know that God is love. And our goal in our Christian walk is to be more like Jesus. And if God is love, then we need to be more loving if possible. Chick Valesco has written a poem called When Jesus Looks. And I want to share that with you this morning. When Jesus looks upon my life, what picture does he see? Does he see his own reflection? Or does he just see me? Does he see his likeness, the product of his hand? Or just another Christian who never took a stand? Does he see a child of God, a child that he set free, living life to honor him? Or does he just see me? What about the other folks I meet along the way? Do I show them Jesus to brighten up their day? When someone looks into my eyes, can they truly see? That calm and gentle peace of God that dwells inside of me. When I reach out and shake a hand, is he right there in my grip? Can they feel that strength from God? that steadies when I slip? When folks are in my presence, do they know his spirit's there? Can they see that he's the one who guides me everywhere? When other people think of me, what is on their mind? Do they think of Jesus Christ, so gentle and so kind? I try to be like Jesus every single day, spreading love, and kindness all along the way. I'm afraid that I have failed. I could not pass the test. Deep inside my heart, I know I haven't done my best. I've had to fight my flesh since the day that I was born. It's always causing trouble at being such a thorn. That's why his spirit dwells in me. He's helping me to learn in every situation where I need to turn. He knew I'd never pass the test. That's why he took my place. He gave his life to save my soul. He suffered my disgrace. Now I try to be like him. I must present him well so other folks will want his gift and turn their backs on hell. Other folks should see the joy that Christ has given me. They should want to have it too, especially since it's free. They should begin to ask me what it is they must do, just how it is they go about getting Jesus too. Then I get to tell them, this wondrous gift is free. It only takes a humble heart a prayer on bended knee. Someday when I'm face to face with the Lord who set me free, will he see his own reflection or will he just see me? I pray that this week and every week 
when others look at us, they see Jesus. Shabbat Mint. Sisters and brothers, would you like to repeat after me? Shabbat Mint. It means happy Sabbath in my language, Mongolian. So whenever I introduce myself that I come from Mongolia, people say, oh, I never heard of that country. Why I don't know much about Mongolia. And maybe probably you are the person that I first meet from Mongolia. And then, then when I mention about Chinggis Khan, then they tend to know where I'm from. The Chinggis Khan who ruled almost over half of the world under his power in history. So today, Mongolia is located above China and below Russia. It's kind of sandwiching in between them. So we are known as the 18th largest country in the world. And we are the, also considered to be the last nomadic country in the world. So today, we have over 3 million population, and almost over 50% of it, they're Buddhist, and over 30% of them, they're non-religious. And only 2.1% of them are Christians and remaining religions. And the history of Seventh-day Adventist Church in Mongolia it's even younger than me. So in 1991, Kathy and her family, the frontier missionaries, left their comfort zone and came to Mongolia to plant First Adventist Church in Mongolia. So this is the leaders of our church and the picture. And by 2018, the two Adventists that were in Mongolia in 1992, one, they're multiplied by not only one digit, by four digits. So now we have over 2,654 members. Uh, we haven't counted the children yet. Those young people are still in a Bible study. So, as you see, the title of my testimony is The Great Mathematician. I'm not here to tell you that I'm the great mathematician, but our God is. The most common thing that they have, mathematicians have, is to solve problem, right? So, it's the same way our God is the best mathematician mathematician who uses the best formulas to solve our problems in our daily lives. So behind this number, there are many people's prayers and hard work and even sacrifices that they have made for this ministry. So I used to think, I used to think that one day, when I was a child, one day I would be somebody who would be able to help people, many people. And then when I was in fifth grade, my middle brother, I grew up with three older brothers, and I always wished to have sister. Uh, when, I, when my middle brother brought me to the church, guess what? I had many sisters there. So I really enjoyed and since then, I keep attending Seventh-day Adventist Church. What I remember from there is uh, I was the youngest in the church when I attended the church first time. So, but now lo no longer. <laughs> so my children's generation is the first generation that they are born and raised in Adventist family. So almost over. Oh, one year ago, my family arrived in the United States of America, and my desire of pursuing higher education led me to this country. Currently, I'm a student of La Sierra. 
and still had that my uh, childhood mind that if I accomplish something great in my personal and professional life, like after I accomplish something, then I would be able to help people. But then God changed my mind. When I get to see the Mongolian sister who's been living with a uh, suicidal mind and brother who's addicted, those families are having family issues. I see that there is a need of people knowing God. So people need God. So people from Mongolia, they're living in the United States. The many people have their own different needs. From there, I also see that many Mongolian adults live and, live, live and work here without knowing English. So I see it in that need. So I wanted to help people. So this is the first English learning group that we had last summer. So people were very happy to have free English class. So I want them to be able to communicate in this language and understand the culture difference. So since then, I started inviting people to church. But this is one of the pictures taken after um, Sabbath service in Olympic Korean Church. The currently Mongolian mission group is under Olympic Korean Church. I would like to say thank you to Olympic Korean Church leaders and pastors and members because they were they welcomed us and they're supporting us, they're praying for us and let us involving the, all the activities they have. So I'm very thankful for that. Okay, one of my sister, Mongolian sister, and she came to knock my door and came to share her burden. And then we end up praying and Bible studying and she left very happy because she got her first Bible in Mongolia. <laughs> so I spend time with them and we do exercise and we go for hiking. And sometimes we think like starting ministry or serving God is very difficult task. Sometimes it's just more than hard work than hard work, isn't it? So we had New Year party. So I would like to say thank you also for Southern California Conference for supporting our New Year party. And we had over 40 people came together and we had activities and everybody enjoyed and they suggested me to open Facebook group for them so that I can announce things, I can teach and I can invite. So these are the people that we are trying to reach out. These people all live in the same apartment complex that I live in Koreatown in Los Angeles. So I would like to also say special thanks to our uh, Mission Road Church for donating their ministry van to our mission group. So my husband and I, we are not pastor or we are not theology student, but we, are, we have decided to share just simply love of God to others who are around us. So our vision of starting the first Adventist church in the United States would be fulfilled with your prayer and with your support. So we would like to see a video. Give thanks to the Lord. For his good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say. His love endures forever.
Let the house of Aaron say, His love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, His love endures forever. So we would like to share his enduring love with other people, other Mongolian sisters and brothers in my living area. So please continue to pray for us so that one day we're going to have that newborn church. Thank you. Thank you, Oka, for telling us about the outreach that you do. You are a blessing to many. We saw their faces. Thank you. You are reflecting God's love. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for those of us who love you, who find a passion, who reach out to others. May all of us share your love, and we ask your blessing on the offering today. Amen. I enjoyed so much, Oka, what you had to share with us. It is such a pleasure to have some international students in our PhD in leadership. We have taken it on as a special mission to prepare them to go back to their countries and lead. And Oka and one of our other international students doing mission here in the United States is such an exciting thing. Um, to have them reaching out to communities here who don't yet know Jesus. I invited one of our other students to come with me to a special program here in Loma Linda one weekend, and he said, well, I can't come to the Friday night one because I'm meeting with a group of Chinese students from La Sierra who don't know Jesus, and I've offered them Bible studies, and I'm studying with them. 
and he's from China himself. And so to see this mission work that's going on and the multiplication that uh, Oka referred to is such an exciting thing. I think we did not mention that her background is computer science and then she's gone on into education and is looking at um, working in the area of counseling and psychology in um, helping to pave the way for an area in her country that no one has known of before and it will be a way for her also to share her faith. So it's very exciting for me, and thank you so much for sharing, and Margaret, for your wonderful mentorship of OCA in the School of Education. Um, we all draw together, and, and students mentor us as well as us mentoring them, so it's, it's a very exciting thing. Our lessons this quarter have been about stewardship, and I found it very interesting because in the other Sabbath school that I go to, uh, my husband organizes the teachers and there were very few teachers who wanted to take on teaching in the area of stewardship. It just wasn't ringing a bell for them. But for me, stewardship is a really exciting thing. And so I've enjoyed the lessons this quarter, studying them and then taking my turn at teaching as well. Today's lesson is about the marks of a steward which I found um, interesting in terms of the title, The Marks of a Steward. And I found as I studied the lesson that maybe this lesson is not so much a lesson that serves up new insights that we had never thought of before, but I think that it serves up timely reminders in the world that we're in today. And I would like to approach it today from the point of view, a lens that I had never seen before until I started preparing to teach. At the time I started preparing to teach, I went to uh, a searchable Bible text and I looked for the word steward to see what the Bible had to say or where the word steward was showing up in the Bible text. And I happened across a story and a lens of looking at stewardship that I had never thought about before. So I'm going to take you there with me today in our look at the lesson of the marks of a steward. And this, uh, this place where I'm wanting to take you is the story of Joseph. Now normally I'm going to assume that most people who come to Sabbath school know the story of Joseph, but just in case someone is watching or listening and doesn't know, let me briefly summarize by saying that Joseph was the son of a clan uh, leader, Jacob, who lived in the ancient Israelite times, and Joseph was one of his two favored sons. And because he was the, a favored son among 12 sons, he was the brunt of jealousies. And his brother sold him into slavery when the father wasn't looking, and he was carried by the slavers to Egypt, where he spent time working his way up from slave to the manager of a household, and then was unjustly accused, and was thrown in jail, and spent several years in jail, and then, through a miraculous set of circumstances, came out of jail and became the head of all of the possessions and the storehouses of the Pharaoh of Egypt. Quite an amazing story. As I looked for pictures about the story that we're looking at today, the lens that I've chosen to look at stewardship through, I found that there was something, someone missing. And here you see Joseph, now toward the end of his story, he's seeing his brothers come in to see him and not recognize who he is. And as I looked at this picture, there was somebody missing from the story that's in the Bible. And then I looked at another picture, Joseph being reunited with his younger brother, Benjamin. And again, a significant figure in the story is missing from the artist's work, not in this picture. So then I went to another picture, and I was taking these all from pictures that are in the public domain so that I could show them here at Sabbath School. And here is a very interesting picture. It's Joseph revealing who he is to his brothers because by this time he looked very Egyptian. And many years had gone by, and his brothers didn't recognize him. And he's revealing his identity to his brothers. And I see right away, I don't know if you see it, but I see Joseph depicted by the artist as a Christ figure 
who is saving the lives of his brothers in this picture, in the way that he's standing there. And so there are his brothers looking up and seeing him, and he's just said, I am your brother Joseph, and they are just absolutely astonished. But there is someone missing from this picture. Who could that be? Well, let me take you to another picture. Here is the picture of jo Joseph's steward finding Joseph's special cup in some sacks of grain that the brothers had been carrying. And here we come upon a man who does not show up very much, nor do we give him much attention in the story of Joseph. And that is his steward. So let me just stop a moment and let's take a look at what a steward does or what the meaning is. Often when I'm giving a lesson, I look, I come across a word and I think I need to go to the dictionary and just make sure I understand the meaning of that word. You know, when we learn language, we learn it in the context of what's around us. We don't learn language by someone saying, here's the word and here's what it means. A lot of times we learn the word, we use the word, and then someone asks us what it means and we're a little bit tongue-tied. Well, well, we all know what it means. No, let me see if I can put in words what it means. Well, that's the way I was relating to the word steward. So I looked it up to see exactly what it says in the dictionary about a steward. And there were several meanings. One who looks after the passengers. They might be passengers on a vehicle. In this case, the passengers in a story going through from one end of the story to the other end. The steward is one who looks after the passengers. The steward is one who supervises arrangements, and certainly that happens in this story. The steward who is one who looks after the property of another. Now I find this rather interesting because Joseph was looking after the property of the Pharaoh, but then Joseph had a steward who was looking after his property. So you can be the steward of a steward, which is kind of interesting to me. And then finally, a steward is one who is the agent of another, acting on behalf of the person who is the master or the employer. So an agent of another. So let's look more closely at the story of this steward. And now, if you're familiar with the story of Joseph, Think about what was happening, but through the glasses, through the lenses of this steward as he participates in the story. Let's go to Genesis 43, and um, I'll take you through it with the text. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to his house steward, bring the men into the house and slay an animal and make ready for the men are to dine with me at noon. So the man did as Joseph said and brought the men to Joseph's house. Now the men were afraid because they were brought to Joseph's house and they said, it is because of the money that was returned in our sacks the first time that we are being brought in. that he may seek occasion against us and fall upon us and take us for slaves with our donkeys. I thought it was interesting that they added with our donkeys. So they came near to Joseph's house steward and spoke to him at the entrance of the house and said, Oh my Lord, we indeed came down the first time to buy food. And it came about when we came to the lodging place that we opened our sacks and behold, each man's money was in the mouth of his sack and our money in full. So we have brought it back in our hand. We have also brought down other money in our hand to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. He said, and this is the steward, be at ease, do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them. Then the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water, and they washed their feet, and he gave their donkeys fodder. So they prepared the present for Joseph's coming at noon, for they had heard that they were to eat a meal there. 
So now let's put the steward right in the center of our story, right in the center. And you can see him in the center now, the way the picture is depicted. In the steward, I think that we can see the marks or the characteristics of stewardship. So let's go back to the text and let's look at the clues that are in the text. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to his house steward, bring the men into the house and slay an animal and make ready, for the men are to dine with me at noon. A steward makes arrangements. Now I want you to think about the steward of Joseph, but then also, because we're talking about our stewardship, apply it to yourself as well. A steward makes arrangements for the master's will to be carried out, and the master should never have to worry that it will be so. So the very first mark of a steward is that that steward is trustworthy. Now, I tried to think about stewardship in terms of uh, examples today, and immediately the person that came to mind was my administrative assistant, Lena. Lena is the person who, when I want something arranged or done, I'll pop out into her office and I'll say, Lena, we're going to have an adjunct professor meeting, and I would like to have all the adjuncts come in and meet with the chairs and we're going to update them on the various things that we would like to have done this year. So would you kindly set up, get arrange for some food to be there, because we'd like to have a mix and mingle time at the beginning where the adjuncts can talk to each other, and the regular professors in the departments can interact with the adjuncts, so have some refreshments there. So Lena's job then is to get the arrangements ready. And I don't give her details. I don't say, I want this kind of food and that type of tablecloth and this kind of flowers. Lena just takes care of it. Now, if it's done and it's all prepared and it's done with quality, but what if the adjuncts arrive for their meeting and I told them, please come to a meeting with the professors and we're going to have a mix and mingle time at the beginning so there will be some refreshments for you. And this goes out in the email to the adjuncts and they arrive at our school, and there's, there are no refreshments out there. What happens then? Well, one thing that might happen is that they're a bit hungry, and they're disappointed because they, told they, they were told there would be refreshments. But not only do I have a question now as to whether my administrative assistant is trustworthy, but those adjuncts have a question about whether I'm trustworthy. Do you see what I'm getting at? So the person who makes the arrangements, the steward, must be trustworthy because what that steward does in making the arrangements that the master asked them to make reflects on the character of the master and how trustworthy the master is as well. We can't be untrustworthy too many times and have people trust the master. Now, I don't say that as a way to guilt you. It's a fact. And we know that we're not perfect people. But as we are the stewards of whatever God has put in front of us, we must be able to be seen as tr trustworthy as often as we humanly can do so. Because the way in which we care for the arrangements for those around us is going to speak of the character of God. So let's go to the next piece. The next verses say, so the man did, this is the steward, so the man did as Joseph said and brought the men to Joseph's house. Closely related to being trustworthy is this particular thing, obedience. So Joseph had asked the steward to go and bring these men to the house and the steward obeyed. It's closely related, but this has to do with our trust of the master. What if you were asked to, asking someone to come to the house and bringing them there is not so hard, but what if you were asked to do something difficult or something that you did not understand and you start to second guess your master and you do something else? Well, it does affect the trustworthiness, but it says a lot more about your relationship with your master as the steward. When the master asks you to do something, your obedience conveys to those around you that you trust 
your master. And so your obedience is an indication, again, back to what is the character of the master? Is the master trustworthy? Do I have a relationship with my master? Am I second-guessing my master? Now, I don't know how it works for you, but there have been a few times that I found myself wondering what my boss was trying to accomplish. And if I was willing to be obedient, usually that would reveal itself. And certainly with this steward. Do you see Joseph explaining his whole strategy to the steward at the beginning of the story? I don't see him explaining it. He takes his steward step by step, just one step at a time. Steward, I'm going to ask you to do this. And then, steward, I'm going to ask you to do that. And never does he say, here's how it's going to work. See, this is a beautiful plan, steward. This is really beautiful. I'm going to show you that what I'll have you do is this, and then they're going to do this, and then I'll have you do this, and they're going to do this. And at the end, it's going to be so cool because this is going to be what happens. Instead, the master, Joseph, just gives one instruction at a time, and it's up to the steward to obey. And at the very end, the steward sees whoa, did you see how that worked out? That worked out wonderfully well because the master now has this whole family who's safe over here, who's available to him. Relationships among the brothers have been healed. There's a whole different thing for my master because of what he did step by step. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that wonderful? So the obedience piece is obedience even when you can't see the whole story. The obedience is the piece that goes one step at a time and says, I trust my master. My master is trustworthy. That's my relationship with the master. So trustworthiness is more how the master relates to the steward. Obedience is more, says more about how the steward relates to the master. Let's go on. So they came near to Joseph's house steward and spoke to him at the entrance of the house and said, and then they all tell their story. And then the steward said, be at ease, do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. And then he brought Simeon out to them. As I read the story, I notice how the steward is very calm. He explains what just happened. He explains what's going on. And he's not doing anything behind the scenes. It's just very straightforward. Be at ease. Be comfortable. He's reassuring. Do not be afraid. Fear is such a driver for people. So calming them down and asking them to not be afraid. And then saying, your God, he's talking to these men from Israel, your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I know you don't understand why it was there. I know you think it makes you look bad but your God is in charge. Everything is on the up and up. There's nothing going on behind the scenes. And oh, by the way, I had your money. And then he brings Simeon out, who they had been missing, and they were afraid Simeon was going to be put to death or put into slavery. So the next mark of the steward then, I term open. The lesson terms it a clear conscience. I think that being open and having a clear conscience go together, actually. If you can be open about what you're doing as a steward of God in your work, you're also working with a clear conscience. It's when we have to hide something. It's when we don't think, make things clear about ourselves or our God to others that we can't adequately represent God's character to others. And that is the goal. That is the goal as a steward. What we do should be representing the character of God to those who don't know him. Being a caretaker of God's property and God's people calls on goodness and openness and humility. Just a little reference, I don't know if you remember the story of Zacchaeus, but I was reading it again this week. And this Zacchaeus was not an open sort of man, and he didn't have a clear conscience. But when he went to see Jesus, Jesus changed his life. And do you notice what Zacchaeus says? I'm going to pay back what I took unfairly four times over, and I am also going to give a huge amount of what I have left to the poor. 
So what he was doing as he prepared to be a steward, as he gave his heart to Jesus, and clearly Jesus had, had changed his heart completely because he had a lot to lose in this, what he was doing was clearing his conscience. He was restoring. He was being open that he had been in the wrong. He was doing everything that he could to make amends, and not only make amends, but go the extra mile in giving to the poor, to say very clearly, I have a clear conscience, I am open, there will be nothing more that is hidden, I will not any longer be trying to take advantage of people for my own gain. That openness and that clear conscience, not doing things for your own gain, but doing it to represent your master, is part of what it takes to be a steward, a good steward. So the next text, the next characteristic of a steward, a mark of a steward. Then the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water, and they washed their feet, which is a symbol of hospitality in that culture, and he gave their donkeys fodder. So he took care of them, and you see this over and over in the Old Testament. We take care of you, and we take care of your animals. It is a gesture of hospitality. So the fourth of the five marks of a good steward is caring. And I have to say that I think that if there is one thing that you see as a characteristic or a mark of a good steward, it has to be the ethic of care for those that are around you. Stewardship as an ethic of care is something that I see a great deal around here both in my home church here at Loma Linda, but also in the wider community. And let me just give you some examples where I see an ethic of care. So maybe we don't go around washing people's feet to be hospitable now. Maybe we don't go around feeding their donkeys or filling their car with gas, although I suppose you could. But there are other ways in which I see the ethic of care. For example, the quilting ladies here at the church. They come together, they have a social time, but they also are preparing little quilts to go out and be a gesture of care to people in need and people going through a tough time. I've also seen such a strong outreach to the homeless here, a real reaching out to the community here. Um, an example of an ethic of care would be a teacher that my husband knows who works in one of the poorest schools in San Bernardino. And she found out that the children were not looking forward to Christmas, right? Thanksgiving? Christmas to Christmas, and the reason the children were not looking forward to Christmas was that when Christmas break began, their food was less, and their stomachs went hungry. When you have a school breakfast and school lunch program at school, at least you have something in your stomachs and you can learn. When vacation comes and you're going hungry at Christmas, that can be really hard. So she started a, a little project to try to give, get people to give baskets that they could take that these kids could take with their families when they went home for Christmas and now she has school children from from areas around and families from areas around who have given to the giving of these baskets to these families so that the children will not go hungry over their Christmas break and it's a huge project now that she does and this was just one teacher in a classroom in a poor school and yet she has changed those children's lives and the meaning of Christmas break for them for the rest of their lives. It's really exciting. My guess is that some of you who are sitting here in the sanctuary have been participants in that project so that children would not go hungry over Christmas. Stewardship and ethic of care. What God gives you to take care of is right in front of you. The question is, what can you do to take care of that need? Another example would be one time we had a faculty meeting and it was with food in the School of Education and I noticed that one of our faculty members was taking the leftovers out with her. Some pans of, of food that we hadn't eaten all of and I said, oh, what are you going to do with that? And she said, well, actually we have some graduate students who have put every dime into their tuition and I know that they don't have enough food to eat. So is it okay if I take the rest of this food and give it to that family? Of course it's okay. An ethic of care, you became aware that someone needed something and you looked for ways to try to meet that need. In this case, Joseph Steward did that same thing, that hospitality for the brothers of Joseph, washing their feet, feeding their donkeys. 
And one more piece of the story, and this is a little bit longer then. So we're back to the steward and his work. Then he commanded his house steward. Joseph commanded his house steward. So here he shows up again, a major character in the story that we never pay too much attention to. Then he commanded his house steward, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food, as much as they can carry, and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack. Put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest, and his money for the grain. And he, the steward, did as Joseph had told him. As soon as it was light, the men were sent away, and they with their donkeys. They had just gone out of the city and were not far off when Joseph said to his house steward, Up, follow the men, and when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you repaid evil for good? Is not this the one from which my Lord drinks and which he indeed uses for divination? By the way, that had me a little confused. You have done wrong in doing this. So I think about this steward, hearing that he's supposed to hide the cup in the sack and put the money in the sacks, and then shortly after these guys get out of town, he's supposed to race after them and accuse them. Now you know Joseph probably had not shown characteristics of falsely accusing people prior to this. He himself had been falsely accused on several occasions. You know Joseph probably had not done that. So the steward is there being told that he is to go out. First of all, he's to plant evidence, and then he's to go out and falsely accuse these men from this tribe in Israel of wrongdoing. Now, had I been the steward, I would have said, wait a second, what? Why? Why why do you want me to do that? That's not like you. And indeed, it would not have been like Joseph. But in the story here, there is no indication that the steward uh, questions his master. He simply is loyal to his master and trusts in his character and goes out and does what his master tells him to do. He's faithful and he's loyal. I think that the loyalty and the faithfulness are like obedience, but a bit more. Loyalty and faithfulness, obedience I think of as I was given a directive and I followed that directive. Loyalty and faithfulness are demonstrated over time. It has to happen again and again and again if someone is gonna say that I'm loyal. I have to be willing to do it again and again and again if someone will see me as a faithful person. This is demonstrated over time. So the steward was loyal and faithful, the mark of a steward. Doing it without reward or without honor, by the way, caring for the master's possessions and the master's people time and time again, even when he didn't see how it was going to work out. Being outward focused over time, not seeking to satisfy himself. And indeed, over time, you notice that nobody tells the story of the steward. He was simply the one who obeyed, who took care of the master's people and the master's possessions without recognition. You know, sometimes I worry about the times that we give people awards because isn't the point that we are faithful and loyal to God over time? Should we be seeking awards or wishing for awards or giving awards? And I'm not telling you yes or no. I just want you to think about that because sometimes it does disturb me about the whole recognition thing. Scott Roden wrote a wonderful book called Steward Leadership. And there are various different models of leadership, but this is the one that just really catches my heart because he says, a steward leader is one who cares about the reputation of the master that he serves and takes care of the people and the things in his care and does not look for recognition. At the point at which you are seeking recognition is when, or wishing for recognition, is when you are no longer a steward leader because it's about you and it's not about the service of your master. And that's a very interesting argument and one that I have thought a lot about. Particularly uh, for those of us who have many talents, we might wish to have those talents recognized because it feels good to do so. But Joseph Stewart doesn't seem to have done that. And many of the finest people that I've known in my life don't seem to seek recognition for their stewardship. And yet they are trustworthy, they're obedient, they're open, they're caring, they're loyal, they're faithful. 
They don't look for loopholes. They don't equivocate. They don't try to make excuses. There's no, well, Lord, I will love these people, but that one, she hurt me, so I'm not going to look after her. There's no, Lord, you put this person in front of me, but frankly, he's horrible. I think I'll look the other way and pass on by. The faithful steward is not like that. The faithful steward looks after whoever it is that God puts in his or her path and cares for whatever possessions that God sees fit to give him or her to care for. The marks of a steward are the marks of true service. There's a quote that I found um, by Ellen White when she wrote in Testimonies for the Church that I like very much. It says, a steward identifies himself with his master. He accepts the responsibilities of a steward and he must act in his master's stead, doing as his master would do if he were presiding. His master's interests become his. Isn't that beautiful? My Lord's interests become mine. The position of a steward is one of dignity because his master trusts him. If in any wise he acts selfishly and turns the advantages gained by trading with his Lord's goods to his own advantage, he has perverted the trust reposed in him. Joseph's steward didn't know where his master was going, but everything that he did was to care for what the master had given him to care for. There's a verse in Peter, 1 Peter 4.10 that says, As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Let's pray. Lord, this morning we see in the story of Joseph's servant the marks of a good steward. And as I said, maybe it's not so much insightful as good reminders in this time, in our lives and in our society, that our service is to be to your honor and glory and that all we do should be to show your character. I pray that you will help us to do that faithfully, loyally, openly, with trust and obedience that we will look after those things that you have entrusted in us. Thank you so much for your love and your trust in us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.